motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever ye do, and your plans will succeed. The Lord works out everything for his own evil and the wicked for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go untouched. Though through love and faithfulness sin is atoned for, through the fear of the Lord a man avoids evil. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes <coughs> his enemies live at peace with him. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. So be it. Children's Church. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, Lord, to freely worship you. We thank you for your word that is standing the test of time. <clears throat> we thank you <clears throat> for the love that you have, that you would send your son Jesus to die for us. We thank you for your spirit that binds us together. Lord, just open our hearts today and have this spirit impact our hearts and our minds to the words that you would have us to hear. We thank you and praise you for the opportunity to read your word and to study scriptures together as a family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we talked about God, who He was, who He is, that He's unchanging, all of His attributes. We said that He's awesome, that we should be in awe of Him. And we're going to learn, ask the question today, who am I? Because you can't ask, answer that question until you know who God is. Everything is about God, His will, His plan, His desires, not ours. <laughs> Go figure that. It's not about us. And we learn that God should be one with a capital G. We know that, but so many times we kind of forget that. We place God into our plans instead of realizing that we're a part of His plans and His schemes. So the question I want to ask you today is, do you believe it? Do you live it? Do you believe as God is a capital G in your life? Satan's and his demons even know who God is. They have reverence and awe for Him, but they choose not to worship Him. They want to steal that worship from him so that the devil can be worshipped instead of you. Jesus says you serve one master or the other. You cannot serve two. So the thing is, is are you honoring God with your lives with a capital G? Do you obey his commands? Do you give him the worship and honor that he deserves? James 2.19 says you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder, implying that you don't even shudder. You believe that He's God, but you don't stand in fear of Him in reverence and awe. Luke 8, verse 30 and 31, Jesus asked this man, He said, What is your name? He says, and, or asked the, this demon, What is your name? Legion, He replied, because many demons had gone into the possessed man. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. They know what is in store for them in their future. They know God is in control, but they choose to rebel. Sometimes we think that God's a loving God. He won't send anybody to hell. He'll let us just keep on doing what we are. We can go on sending. Paul addressed that. He said, should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? No. We know better. We are His children if we have been born again. And we should live a life that shows the worthiness of that. We should be like Christ. So who is God to you? That is the question that will define who you are. Who am I? If I don't recognize God for who He is, it will define me differently than if I truly recognize. If I don't recognize who He truly is, I will live a life that I am the God of my life, that I follow my will rather than His own. I have to truly realize who He is and accept that so that I can live a life according to His plans. He designed me. He created me. Isaiah 40, 21 and 22 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. 
That's who God is, whether we understand it or not. Nothing is beyond His grasp. Nothing is out of His control. Everything that we see that we are marveled and amazed at, it's all because of God. Do you pay much attention to grasshoppers? Probably not. That's how insignificant we are. But, you know, I'm not saying Isaiah didn't know how to compare. I'll say that he definitely knew how to compare because of our thought process, our mentality at the time. The best analogy he could give to the people of that day was, see that little insect down there? That's how you compare to God. But see, we know so much more now. We're wise, aren't we? And we know that the stars out there are big, giant balls of energy and gas. We know what their power is. They're not just pinpoints in the sky, holes in a curtain where light comes through. They're massive energy cells. Some that would just make our sun look like a dot compared to them. But yet our sun alone, which is just an average star at best, if we weren't exactly the right distance from the sun, had exactly the right tilt on, our, on the axis, exactly the right amount of water, were exactly the right atmosphere with the right components, the sun's in energy would literally vaporize us. That's the kind of power that the sun produces. And God said, let me put billions and billions of these into the, into the universe, to the galaxies. That's our God. And He says, I created you. He chose to love us. If you go back a couple verses, Isaiah 40, 15 says, Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Well, that's not the same comparison as grasshoppers, is it? Nations, not nation, but all the nations, all the people, all the governments, all their power is like but a drop in a bucket. You can't see the drop in the bucket. It's insignificant. We have the same knowledge going the other way. We can see small things now. We know that the body is made up of cells and we can see God's design there. Things that we couldn't see without the aid of a microscope. If you use a 400 times microscope, you can see a blood cell. If you use a thousand time microscope, that means a thousand times more than you can see with your naked eye. It's, it's been magnified that many times. You can see how a blood cell operates and everything. And they've got magnifying glasses that'll go further than that. And guess what we figured out when we got a thousand time magnifying glass? We figured out that the life was in the blood. <laughs> God already knew that, didn't he? But we figured that out finally. We found that, that there's coagulating agents in the blood, that the blood carries nutrients to the body and takes away contamination from the body. We said, man, we are smart. Well, how was it that Moses said in Leviticus 17, 14, because the life of every creature is in its blood. God designed and created everything. He knows everything. And when He created, when I think about that and I contemplate on that, there were no mistakes. Everything was perfect. Wow, the amount of knowledge and power that had to be there. And He created all of this out of nothing. This is who God is. We are not even a microscopic speck compared to us is what we are compared to God. But yet He chooses to love us. We wouldn't love anything that insignificant. We can't even love our spouses the way that we should or our children the way that we should. But God chooses to love us and He will never, ever change. So the question today is, who am I? If we know who God is, then we know who we are. Because we have all those things that the bulletin says. I am everything that I am because of God and nothing without Him. And I will suffer the consequences if I don't realize my sin against a righteous and holy God. But He loved me enough that He prepared a sacrifice for me. He sent His Son to take my place. All of my sin and shame and everyone's sin and shame that ever has been born, that are being born now and will be born, were taken upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And He paid the price so that we could be redeemed back to God. So I want to go back to the Old Testament a little bit today. In Genesis we find out who God is, that we were created in His image, that He created everything that He created, that it was perfect, that He even loved us beyond perfection. He made relationships and He allowed us to be married and created a mate. And He created families and reproduction. Mothers had the ability to reproduce and to be a mother that He built that instinct in. And fathers were able to govern their children and to raise their children up in the ways of the Lord. But what happened? Sin came into the garden. And man was uh, ejected from the garden. Then sin got worse and worse and worse. Finally, it was 10 million to one roughly. One righteous man stood because of his faith 
Because of his belief in God, it was accounted as to him unto righteousness. That was Noah. And because of his faithfulness, God was going to destroy the earth completely, but he said, no, I'll save Noah and his family. And he took them into the ark. And then the population started increasing again. Four generations later, we have Nimrod. We have, after one, even Noah's sons rebelled. But after four generations, we have the world increasingly wicked, serving them all, their own selves, saying, we don't care about you, God. We'll build a tower so we can escape you, really. Come on. We want to be in control of our own destinies. We don't want to serve you for who you are. And God makes a promise with one man, Abraham, and says, your children will be many. And, and Abraham had to wrestle with that because it took forever to have his child. And then God asked him to sacrifice his child. But God made a promise. He said, your children will be numerous. And your, your children will be the nation that I call. They will be my chosen people, my children. But here we get to the end of Genesis, and it really looks like all hope is lost because now God's chosen people are in a foreign land. We can't figure out how they got there, and they're captives and they're slaves. So if we read in Exodus 1, verses 1 through 11, it says, These are the names of the son of Israel who went to Egypt, with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Look, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. Things don't look so good, does it? Where are God's promises? Where is He? How is our faith now? Because God promised us all these things, and we're slaves, and things were good in Egypt for a while, when Joseph was here and everything, but now they're terrible. We're slaves. Not only are we slaves, but we're oppressed. Where is God? Who am I if God is not who He says He is? Does that change what I believe and how I act? But God is faithful. Even when you can't see Him, He is there. He hears your prayers. He is in control. He has the perfect plan even though you can't understand it or comprehend it. Why will God never leave us or forsake us? Why are His plans perfect in every way? Because that's who He is. Even when you spit in His face and say, I don't want you, He's still there with His arms out saying, come to me. 1 John 4.10 says, This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. How many generations of His children rebelled and turned their back before this was written? And God was still faithful and true. Jesus Christ came on the scene after four years of silence, not hearing from God at all. But He was still there. He still kept His covenants. He still had a plan to save His people and even to bring children to a new relationship that they never understood before as, as personally God's children and dwelling in the Spirit. We did nothing to deserve, to deserve creation or all the good things that we have. Even in the times of suffering, we are so blessed. And all we have to do to become His children is accept that free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. We've done nothing. And there's nothing we can do that will stop us from being able to accept it. If we accept it, we are born again. That should change your identity. You are chi child of God. You are born again. That means you have to die to be born again. That old creation has to die. And you are born again with new life, new power, new ability, born as God's child, as heirs of the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. God loves His children. His love will never cease. He will never turn His back or turn away. There's nothing that you can do that will do that. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers neither height nor depth, 
nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. The Pharaoh can't do it. 400 years of, of not hearing from God and being taken over by the Romans will not do it. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, God that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because through Jesus Christ our Lord, we are saved and born again. We be belong to God. The Israelites didn't understand this. We don't understand this the way we should. God loves His children. He knows His children. He wants the best for His children. Going back to Exodus chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 say, But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. There is blessings even in the cursings there. The nation prospered in times of slavery. There were 70 when we went into this, and there are millions that come out of Egypt. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them even more ruthlessly. Where is God? Has He stopped caring? Has He abandoned us? You know that's what they think. We think it when something goes bad one day in our life. Where are you, God? I wanted to go fishing today and it's raining. Where are you? Things possibly couldn't get worse, could they? Yeah, they could. Then Pharaoh gives an order to the midwives to kill all the baby boys that were born. Where are you, Lord? Why, Lord? Verse 17 says, The midwives, however, there's that complete opposite like butter yet, however, they feared God, which is the beginning of wisdom, and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. Now, the king of Egypt was basically the most powerful man in the world. That's who they disobeyed. They said, no, we fear God, not man. What can you do to us? And they said, I will not kill the boys. Thank goodness some people still lived in fear of God. They had wisdom that comes from heaven, not wisdom of this world. They didn't lose hope. They knew that God was still there, that His ways were true. Even though they hadn't seen Him, even though things looked bad, they still knew that God was awesome and they were in awe of Him and they worshipped Him. But yet things still got worse. Verse 22 says, And Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. We keep being faithful. Some of us do and it doesn't matter. Things still get worse. There's no hope left. Our baby boys are being murdered. 1 Timothy 4, 9-10 through 10 says, This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. He's saying, hello, listen. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God. Nothing can oppose God. And if He cares for you, He cares for you. It won't change. Who is the Savior of all people and especially to those who believe. God is there. He will not leave or forsake you. If you go back and look at Exodus 1 verse 20, it says, So God was kind. We're going backwards from verse 22. It says, So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, He gave them families of their own. Because we're obedient, because we recognize who God is, follow His commands, that we're a light to this world, He blesses us even more. He knows that it's not easy. Jesus said, come follow me. He didn't say, come follow me, but do this first. He said, come follow me. And then people said, well, I will follow you when? He said, come follow me now. There's no strings attached. Either you're going to serve me or you're not. Never forget who God is. Never try to place Him in a box. He is God who holds the stars in His hands. And He holds you in His hand as His loving child. He won't let anything happen to you. He won't forsake you. He's there to be your Father. If you believe in Jesus, you're born again. You are God's very own child. That's who you are. Who am I? You are God's child. You belong to Him. But things kept getting worse for the Hebrew people. And then we read in chapter 2 that a man from the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, 
And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh da Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her fa female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. When his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Now, we might think things are bad, but can you not see God all the way through that? It was one individual, that's fine, but it was one individual, and God had a plan for that one individual to save the nation. Why did his mother choose to deny Pharaoh? Why did Pharaoh's daughter find Moses? Why was it her? Why wasn't someone else? Why didn't something happen? I don't know if you know it or not, but Florida has crocodiles now that come from the Nile River. They're man-eaters. Why did Moses make it that far? All because God was in control and God had a plan. Didn't look like it at the time, but now we have hindsight, don't we? How many times can we see that in our life? Where God was there, even though at the time we didn't think He was there. We didn't think He cared. All the Israelite boys were being mur murdered, but Jochebed loved her child. She feared God and trusted God. She disobeyed the God of the world with a little g to serve the God of all creation with a big g. And look what happened. Her baby was not only saved, but she got to raise it. She got to raise her child. She never knew that. She never fathomed that when she put Moses in the, in the river. She thought that was the end of her seeing her child, but she loved him enough that even if she couldn't have him, that she would send him on hoping that he would live, that God would take care of him. But you know, that's not how awesome it. God, God is awesome. He's more awesome than that. Go back or go forward one verse to verse 9. It says, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the baby and nurse him for me, and I'll pay you for it. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. She got paid to take care of her own child that should have been killed. Now if that's not God in control and loving for your faithfulness, then I don't know what is. So why do we sit there from time to time and say, oh, I know God you're calling me to do this, but it's going to cost me. It's going to cost you not to follow God. It's going to cost you immensely to not follow God. You have no idea the riches and grace that He can pour out upon you. If you keep reading, verse 10, it says, When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Now Moses is the prince of Egypt, isn't he? Who would have seen that coming? She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the, the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I, did, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled. Now it looks things like whatever hope we did see a little bit of is gone again, doesn't it? And Moses doesn't realize who he is, does he? By this age, he knows that his mom put him in. She did not tell him. He knows that his mom put him in the Nile. He shouldn't be alive. He knows that Pharaoh rescued him. He's in the... In the uh, castle, it's not a castle, whatever. He's in the kingdom, in the, in the rooms of the Pharaoh, and he thinks, I am in control of my destiny. God didn't save me. It's just chance that this happened to me. I'm in control. And I'll go out here and show everybody how much control I'm in. They'll listen to me. What happens when we disobey? We run, don't we? But God had a plan for him. Who am I? Moses didn't understand that. God spared Moses. He allowed his mother to, to raise him. He allowed her to be paid for it. He allowed Pharaoh's daughter to be the one to find him. He allowed Moses to be raised in the Pharaoh's house, the grandson of the most powerful person in the world. God did all this because Moses belonged to God. God had a plan for him, but Moses didn't realize it. He thought he was in control of his own destiny and now 
He wasn't in control of anything, was He? When we think we're in control, it's not, e not very hard for us to find out we're not in control of anything. When we wake up tomorrow and find a disease that we have or a love loved one lost, that we weren't in control of anything. God is there. He is in control and He loves us. It is who He is, not who we are. We need to remember that. That's a wonderful truth to cling on to because we are not what we think we are. But God is everything we can imagine and so much, so much more. Well, it goes on and Moses establishes a new life. He leaves his, the old life behind. He's not the prince of Egypt anymore, but everything's good. He's developing his own family and everything. And we jump to verse 21 of chapter 2 and it says, Moses agreed to stay with a man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. I don't know if you've caught this or recognized this, but that's exactly what Paul says about us. We're foreigners in this land. We do not belong here. I'm not talking about Bonner's Ferry. I'm talking about this world. Because when we're born from above, born again, we're born from above, we don't belong here anymore. Our home is in heaven with God. And we need to start living like that that very instant and continue living that way. This world doesn't matter. All that matters in this world is that we can be a light to men, that we can glorify our Father who is in heaven, that we can worship Him and bring honor and glory to Him. It's not about the life we've set up for our own. God will call you. God may be calling you now. And we'll see that this is exactly what happens with Moses. He thinks everything's fine. I, I blew it. I lost my, my chance at ruling the world. But I've got a good life now. I've got a family I've got a child. Remember, that goes back to Genesis when God blessed us with that in the first place. Those blessings came from God. We wouldn't have those blessings if it weren't because He loved us. So verse 23 says, During that long period, so Moses had a long period of his life where he got to enjoy things. But God was saying, You're going to do my calling. Moses is 80 years old now. The king of Egypt had died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cries for help because of their slavery went up to God. God. God heard their groanings and He remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned. He recognized. He was concerned always. But He recognized and was going to do something about it because it's in His timing. He knew it the whole time. But now is the time to see. People didn't expect Moses to come back on the scene. He's long gone. Their hopes are gone even further. But as we read, we find out that God tells Moses, you're going to go back to show my wonders and my might. And as a result, my children will be set free. Free to worship me, given the land that I promised them. Because it's all about bringing about God's glory. So while Moses was fat and happy, saying we say, that God's children were suffering dying. Does that sound anything like today? We sit in the United States, we're fat and happy, and there are people all over this world that are suffering. There's enough food, there's enough finances to feed them, but there's not enough people willing to do what it takes to do it. But you know, that's not the important thing. The important thing is if they die without knowing, without hearing the gospel message, then their soul is lost for all eternity. That's what matters the most. That matters much more than our jobs, our families, anything else. That we would tell others when Jesus is calling you to spread the gospel message, here I am, send me. Because when God tells you to go, number one, He's in charge. And number two, He's got something wonderful in store for you. Moses doesn't understand this. If we read on, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. He thinks the world's just going on. The priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see that strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. At least Moses recognized that. He knew who God was, and he knew where he was. He just didn't know who he was. God said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. See, we do know who God is. We just fail to recognize it. And that's what makes our identity. We need to recognize who He is every day. And that will determine our steps and our path. Verse 7 says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. Moses didn't catch that part. It's all because of God. He'll empower you. He'll give you the abilities you need, the power you need, the strength you need to get the mission done that He calls for. It's not because of us, it's because of Him. I have come down to rescue him, them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the, of the Israelites has reached me, and I have, been, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. There's where we lose it, don't we? Moses just hid his face and everything, and now he says, Go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, my people, the, to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11 says, But Moses said to God, Who I am I? There's our problem. We want to say we recognize God. We say, Yes, I realize all this, but when it comes down to leadership and lordship of my life, we sometimes stumble. God, you are God's child, but He wants you to be His obedient child because of the love that He wants to pour out on you. And we should see that in the evidence that He loved us so much that He sent His only Son to die for us. Why would we hesitate to say, yes, send me, I'll go? Why would we want to say but? And if we read on, and we're not going to read on any further today, we'll see that Moses continued to say, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. I'm not this, I'm not that. No, duh. But God is everything. And that's what we have to realize. And God is calling each and every one of us to do whatever He's calling you to do. I don't know what it is. He might be calling you strong right now. It may be a whisper. and It may be in the future. You might have that time, that long term of silence. Even when you don't understand His will, you know His will because it's right here. You know how to act every single day of your life. So when you don't want to forgive that person, when you want to go to bed at night mad at your spouse, that's not what His will is. It's clear in His Word. But when it goes out beyond that and says, I need to go witness to the neighbor down the street or I need to help him financially, then remember it's God who's calling you to do it. He wants His children to obey Him out of love. So will you recognize who He is? Or will you say, but, like Moses? Father, we thank You so much for all that You do for us. Especially today, Lord, we think we live in a land that is... We know that we live in a land that is so far from You. And that maybe that You've forgotten about us, but You haven't. You're right there. You love Your children. If this is one nation under God, then Lord, help us who say that we are Christians act like Christ. Give us boldness. Give us strength. Give us everything that we need to empower us to do the task that You have before us. Father, we just thank You for the love that You have given us, for who You are so that we can better understand who we are. And we just pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.